Dear all, well, me direct thanks you for joining this webinar, the first in the me direct series being hosted online. This webinar is aimed at providing you with information and insights on the current situation we are living in. Me direct has always been at the forefront of providing you with the latest on the investment world, and we aim to continue doing so through our regular updates on our website and social media accounts. Our team of experienced wealth advisors are always available to assist you. Franklin Templeton, one of the biggest fund managers in the world, has joined us for today's webinar. We will be discussing the coronavirus' effects on financial markets and the current volatility we are experiencing. Our renowned guest speakers will also be discussing the current shocks in the investment world with a historical perspective. I will leave you now in the good hands of our speakers. Bill Francis will be giving you a very brief overview of Franklin Templeton, he will be followed by Leo Niers. Leo will be discussing the current shocks in the investment world with a historical perspective. Elsa Goldberg will also be joining us from the US and will be giving a global macro overview of the current economic, political, and financial market conditions. Bill, over to you. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and self-isolating. Uh, we are in lockdown now, like in the UK, and it's only day three. Uh, my name is Bill Francis, and I've been coming to Malta since early 2008. Uh, it was just before the last financial crisis, when the world stopped for around six months. Twelve years later, we are in another unprecedented crisis, which affects us all. Uh, we were due to be in Malta this week, and we were due to be doing a presentation with you at this time in a local hotel. Unfortunately, that is not possible, so we have decided to do this webinar, and hopefully this will be of some use to you going forward. Um, what we will briefly do is I will um, explain who Franklin Templeton are. We will then have Leo Nairs talk about the history of the financial markets putting the coronavirus into some context. And then our institutional portfolio manager, Elsa Goldberg, will give her color views and outlook on the markets with relation to the global bond, total return, and emerging market net funds. So first of all, Franklin Templeton is a US asset management house. We are based in San Mateo, which is close to San Francisco. Um, we uh, currently have around 9,000 employees uh, and we are situated in many countries around the world. We, have, we were founded in 1947 and our, and our aim is to deliver long-term performance over the, over the kind of medium and the longer term. As you can see from this slide, around 75 to 80 percent of our funds have outperformed over the last 10 years. We are a truly global investment manager. We are currently situated in 34 countries. We have numerous research locations and we have 12 trading locations. What you, what you also may have heard recently is we have acquired or we are in the process of acquiring Leg Mason. Uh, this deal is still going through the, um, the regulatory approval and should be finalized in September and October of this year. Uh, what that will mean is that Franklin Templeton will then become one of the largest asset management houses in the world with assets around $1.5 trillion and will currently put us in the top 10. This is the history of the organization. As you can see, we were founded in the US back in 1947, and over the years, we have entered into kind of many local markets. We currently have around 265 investment managers, um, and the average tenure of our managers is around 23 years of experience. This, I believe, is very important in this current situation, as many of our managers have experienced previous financial crises and previous market sell-offs. 
um, which is important to have a calm head in these difficult times. Now I will introduce Leo Nears. Leo Nears is part of the Franklin Templeton Learning Academy. Leo has also accompanied me on many trips to Malta over the last two to three years. And Leo will now introduce himself and we'll do an update on the history of the financial markets in relation to the coronavirus. Without further ado, over to you, Leo. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, introduction, uh, Bill, and good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for attending this uh, webinar from uh, Franklin Templeton. So my name is Leo Niers. I'm the EMEA lead for the Franklin Templeton, which I will tell you a bit more about shortly. Uh, but first of all, I would like to uh, introduce some um, technicalities as to how you can participate effectively in this webinar session today. Um, so if you have any technical difficulties, uh, please uh, refresh your uh, browser, right? Uh, if you have any audio issues, ensure you have only one webinar window open and check your speakers or headset settings. And if you have any buffering or streaming issues, close all your open application or try a different browser. Um, so this is going to be an uh, interactive webinar today. So the success won't only uh, depend on me. It will also very much depend on your participation today. Uh, so you can participate uh, today through Pulse questions, which I will send out, and also to group chats. And I will shortly explain how you can um, open the group chat window. Uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, please ask your questions. There will be an opportunity to, uh, for that. So please, in the interest of time, save your questions for the end of the webinar. And please fill out the feedback survey, uh, which will automatically pop up at the end of the webinar. Now, at the bottom of your screen, you should see your webinar console. Uh, and most importantly, is to open your group chat Item. So that's the, uh, the item with the uh, dialog boxes. Uh, so if you open that, uh, you could uh, participate and answer some questions. Um, and there's also a resource button where you can download some of our materials in um, that belong to this <laughs> webinar. So just send a message in the group chat. So I will ask some questions and you can answer those questions via the group chat. Well, I hope that is clear to everyone. Uh, then very shortly about the Franklin Templeton Academy. So the Franklin Templeton Academy offers a global educational program as a value-added service to our clients. And the program seeks to support financial professionals in their day-to-day -day job. And we do this by offering pragmatic and interactive training on the financial markets and investment concepts independent of our Franklin Templeton product offering. So we offer around 25 different courses. And if you are interested in any of those courses, please visit our website, franklintempletonacademy.com. Right? And you can attend those courses in three different formats. Um, uh, half of the uh, 25 courses we have available in e-learning. So you can do them on our website in your own time. Uh, we've got classroom training, like Bill said. We've, uh, we travel to Malta quite regularly to do live sessions. And today we do a, a webinar session, which you can attend from your desk. And we run these sessions with a certain <coughs> style, right, with a number of values. So uh, first of all, I won't mention any of our funds of our products. So the session I will deliver will be purely product agnostic and independent of our funds. So the session should be pragmatic, and that specifically applies to today's session. The idea is really to provide you some pragmatic tips as to how to navigate uh, well through these times of volatility. Hopefully the session is informative as well, and like I said, we like to make this uh, session interactive. So please participate via the group chat today. Right, then let's move on to our uh, topic on uncharted water. So the financial markets are going through a turbulent time at the moment. And the aim of this presentation is to place the current market volatility and shocks into a historical perspective. This 
describe how various emotional biases affect our decision-making ability and to provide three proven strategies to help you better cope with that market volatility. But first of all, I'd like to ask you a question via the group chat. So what words would you use to describe the current financial markets, the current state of the financial market? And maybe you can show your, um, your, your state of mind, uh, how you're thinking about the financial markets at the moment via the group chat. So what words would you use to describe the current state of the financial markets? And I see some of you are joining the group chat, so perhaps you can answer the question. And uh, we have um, a lady on the call called Rachel, and Rachel says frightening. And I see that uh, Braden says panic selling. Um, uh, panic, indeed, I think that's a great word and something we will uh, be addressing today. Um, Turbulence, uh, Ruth say, a roller coaster is what Giovanni is saying. So we will address those words um, uh, that you all mentioned in this webinar today. Uncertainty, fragility, there's certainly a lot of emotion going on. We will address those emotions in this webinar today. So thanks for participating there. Right, but um, let's, uh, with all these events basically um, in the news and related market volatility, investors may be wondering, uh, how are these events impacting my investments, right? And, and what you see here is this chart shows the growth of the MCI All Country World Index over roughly the past uh, 10 years through um, the 12th of March, 2020. And during this time period, we've been fortunate enough to experience a bull market. Some investors who've just started investing recently have never experienced a significant downturn. However, this is where we are today. Uh, so let's zoom in on this more recent period since the start of the global coronavirus. Right, so let's go over some recent events and the resulting impacts on the market. So on the 31st of December 2019, the coronavirus uh, disease was first reported from Wuhan, China. And the government in Wuhan, China confirmed that health authorities were treating dozens of cases. On January 11th, the Chinese state media reported the first known death from an illness caused by the virus, which had infected dozens of people. Uh, on the 31st, sorry, on the 30th of January 2020, it was the World Health Organization who declared an international public health emergency as cases are reported outside China. Three days later, the first coronavirus death was reported outside China. Uh, then we move to uh, February 23rd, uh, when the virus spread to Europe and the cases of the coronavirus surged in Italy. Um, from about uh, five to more than 150 uh, number of fatalities. Uh, Northern Italian towns went into lockdown as well. Uh, and finally, on the 11th of March, uh, the World Health Organization declared uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic and the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, entered bear market territory. Also, on the 12th of March, President Trump announced its travel ban on most uh, European countries, except for Britain, which raised the prospect of a worldwide economic slowdown. So the combination of the coronavirus outbreak and the oil price reductions is unprecedented. And it may be too early to tell how this will impact the economy. However, we do know that volatility can cause investors to act on their emotions and that lessons learned from the past can help in navigating these uncharted waters. Right, so what uh, will you learn today? What are the uh, objectives of this module? So first of all, we'll place the current shocks into a historical perspective. Secondly, we recognize how emotions affect our decision-making ability. And finally, we identify three strategies to better cope with market volatility. But while most investors know that the market goes through cycles, it's in times like these that when markets are stormy, that emotions are running high. So a historical view focusing on relevant research, solid data, and proven strategies can help put current events into perspective. 
So let's look at the past. And this is a chart that we've been using a lot in the uh, academy, the bull and bear chart. So this expresses global uh, equity markets by the MSCI world uh, into bull and bear periods. And a bear market is defined as a drawdown of 15% or more. And this is still quite conservative as most bear markets are defined as a uh, drawdown of at least 20%. And a bull market starts when the previous bear market has reached its maximum drawdown and continues until another 15% decline or more. And what you can clearly uh, can notice from this chart are two things. First of all, you see that the amplitude or the average decrease um, during uh, bear markets uh, was much smaller than the average increase during bull markets. Secondly, you can see that on average, bull markets have lasted much longer than bear markets, right? And that's what we have summarized here. So on average, over that period of almost 50 years since the end of the 60s, we see that the average growth during uh, bull markets was around 167%, and that the bull markets on average tended to last three years and 11 months, and um, the average fall during bear markets was minus 31 percent and bear markets tended to last one year exactly on average and this is why one of our founding fathers sir john templeton uh, said it's time in the market not timing of the market that helps you to generate robust investment results right um and then let's move on to see how markets have rebounded from viral outbreaks Right. While the past is certainly not a predictive of the future, it does offer some valuable perspective. Viral outbreaks are not new to the markets. And while markets react to the news um, events in the short term, they've tended to reward patient investors over longer periods of time. For example, in 2003, SARS saw 8,000 people infected. And it was brought to an end by good hygiene, like hand, hand washing, which is recommended now with the uh, coronavirus as well, and environmental factors. It burned out when enough people became infected to build an immunity to disease. In 2009, there was the swine flu. And in 2014, the Ebola virus in West Africa ended with human intervention when the World Health Organization declared a coordinated international response. Countries worked together to administer to the sick, and when a second outbreak occurred in 2018, treatments developed from the first outbreak were offered to patients. And finally, in 2015, we had the, uh, or 2016, we had the outbreak of the Zika virus. And that brings us to today. Uh, and there's nothing exactly like the coronavirus. We don't know yet how everything is going to play out, but you can compare it to historical epidemics to help put things in perspective. Right, and this is quite an interesting chart as historically the markets have tended to rebound quickly from viral epidemics. And what you, this chart shows is the performance of prior epidemics from the start of global interest to the peak in global interest. And we measure global interest by the number of story counts on the virus in Bloomberg. So you see that one month after the peak in global interest of these viral outbreaks, the market showed signs of recovery, right? And that, um, uh, that was on average 12.3%. Three months after the peak of global interest, the markets on average saw a gain of 23%. So you see that markets tended to have recovered from viral outbreaks in the past. Right, then let's move on and let's start talking about what's going on in our heads. At the end of the day, we're all emotional beings. And when volatility strikes, many of us feel like we're riding a roller coaster, as some of you mentioned on the chat. So let's find out what's going on in our heads and why. So remember the caveman, so the amygdala in your brain, that's the reflexive part of your brain, may help when you're confronted by a tiger, for example. So based on past experience, the amygdala would tell the caveman that now is the time to run. In fact, the amygdala is often associated with a fight or flight response. 
But letting our reflective brain control our reactions when making financial decisions may lead to some undesirable outcomes. So let's talk about some emotional biases. And then we'll start with anchoring. And anchoring means that we often focus too heavily on one piece of information when making decisions. And you know that when a stock uh, price rises, right, and at some point reaches an all-time high, but then decreases a little bit, but is still higher than your original purchase price, then to the investor that still feels as a loss, as we're anchored to that all-time high. That's an example of anchoring. So even when presented with new information, we remain anchored to the old piece of information. Right, and that's something what you see here. So um, anchors have a powerful hand in our decision making and create unrealistic expectations for investors. So we asked investors in a survey to tell us their average annual portfolio return expectations over a five-year period. And the median uh, response was an annualized return of about 8.5%. However, when presented those investors with a hypothetical market that was up 20% that year, uh, they suddenly adjusted their return expectations to around 15%. So the introduction of that hypothetical 20% anchor caused investors to abandon their original return expectations, and um, they expected a stronger return. Now, let's see how that works uh, in practice, right? So now let's see how anchoring can influence the way we feel about our investments. Imagine uh, investing $10,000 10 years ago and setting a goal to earn, let's say, a 7% average annual return on your portfolio. Here you see that you would end up with almost uh, $20,000 with that 7% annualized return. But let's now follow uh, the markets, in this case, the MSCI All Country World. You see that if you would have stayed invested with the MSCI All Country World over the last uh, 10 years, you would have gained um, an investment amount if you had invested $10,000 of almost $25,000. Uh, so the reality is that markets uh, don't move in a smooth fashion. And here you see that um, if markets going up, you might adjust your return expectation to a higher uh, return, which might result in you being disappointed if the market sells off again. Right? Well, you're still on track of your long-term goal. So again, it's important to keep focused on your long-term strategy and not let anchoring that may come in with short-term volatility steer you astray. Um, the next bias is loss aversion, and loss aversion is the pain we associate with loss is much more intense than the reward felt from a gain. Uh, loss aversion is sometimes also referred to as the disposition effect, that we all have the tendency to sell the winning stocks in our portfolio in order to lock in that gain and to hold on to the losing stocks in our portfolio. And if you think about that rationally, then you always end up with a portfolio full of loss-making investments, right? Uh, now, Daniel Kahneman was a famous uh, psychologist who actually won the Nobel Prize in uh, economics in uh, the 1990s, and he did a famous experiment on loss aversion with some of his students. Um, so he did the following experiment with his students. He uh, introduced a friend who wants to make a bet with you, and will, you will have a, a 50% chance of losing 10,000 euros or a 50% chance of winning an unspecified amount of money. So how much would you want to be able to win before you would accept the possibility of losing 10,000 euros? Can somebody answer that on the chat? So let's say a friend wants to make a bet with you um, and you'll have a 50% chance of losing 10,000 euros and a 50% chance of winning an unspecified amount. So how much would you want to be able to win at least uh, to be able to accept the possibility of losing 10,000 euros? Is there anybody on the chat who wants to give an answer? 
So how much would you want to be able to win before you would accept the possibility of losing 10,000 euros? And I can already reveal that there is no right or wrong here. Alexander says 15,000. Mario as well, 15,000. So that would be one and a half times as much, right? Uh, 15,000. And I think that's a very reasonable answer. Ruben says 50,000, so five times as much. Uh, Jonathan actually says 20,000, and that's exactly uh, the um, number that Daniel Kahneman found out with his students, right? So he found out that on average, uh, people would at least accept 20,000 euros before they would go ahead with this bet. And he concluded, therefore, that people care twice as much uh, about their losses then they care about their gains, right? And so this loss aversion basically drives us into uh, safe haven assets, right? That's one of the consequences of loss aversion. Now, here I have another question for you. What do you think this number represents? Um, so we're talking here about uh, 1.2 trillion euros. 1.2 trillion uh, euros and it's not the uh, asset under management of uh, franklin templeton i can already reveal um it's another uh, amount it might be difficult to guess but um would anybody have an idea what this amount would represent so 1.2 trillion euros anybody on the chat who has an idea what this amount in europe might represent not the, uh, any monetary stimulus uh, or anything. Um, again, I realize it's hard to uh, guess what this number uh, will be or represents. Uh, it's not the US budget. Uh, Joseph says money in my account. That's uh, suspicious as well. Um, it's not the amount of global investment. It's actually the investment amount currently invested in money market funds in Europe. So, uh, yeah, the amount currently invested in money market funds. Now, you already can obviously imagine what the problem with that is. Is that that doesn't yield anything because we, for years, we've been in this low yielding environment. So, if we look, for example, at the uh, nominal yields on the euro area money market accounts, then you see that currently that is negative already, minus 0.05%, uh, right? But specifically, if we look at the real yield, or in other words, adjusted for inflation, then you see that for years, basically, investors have been losing out with money on their bank account. And you see the current inflation adjusted money market yield is minus 1.9%. So having your money in a bank account at the moment might not be as safe as, as you think it might be. Right, so how to live with market volatility, right? Uh, so what can we do today? Let's analyze three strategies that can help investors live with market volatility. The first one is to focus on the long term. First and arguably the most important concept of investing is to stay calm and keep a long term perspective. Now this is something you see happening in the markets today. So here over the last 10 years, we listed the 20 worst trading days and we listed the 20 best trading days. And what you see is that often a worst trading day is immediately followed by a best trading day. Yeah? Like I say, that's what you've been seeing over the last couple of weeks uh, in terms of volatility. After a worse trading day, you see immediately the bounce back the next day, right? And it's impossible to time the market. Nobody knows what's happening tomorrow, right? Um, and specifically, uh, you see that jumping in and out of the market can be costly, right? Um, here we see that over that same period of 10 years, basically, if you would have missed the best 10 trading days over that 10-year period, your annualized return would be 5.4%. Would you have missed the best 20 days, it would be 2.8%. Would you have missed the best 
30 days, it would be 0.5%. And if you would have stayed fully invested, you would have earned 9% over that on an annualized basis over that 10 year period. So again, that uh, illustrates how important those best trading days are for the overall return and how costly it can be to miss them. All right, then I've got a next question for you. How often do you currently look at your portfolio? Maybe you can uh, be honest and answer that question on the chat. So how often do you currently look at your portfolio? Is that uh, daily? Is that on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, or uh, quarterly, or just once a year? Adrian says daily. Uh, even most of you says daily. And in my opinion, that's one of the uh, drawbacks of uh, today's time, where we have too much access to information, right? Um, the best way for investors is to stay calm, not to act on their emotion and to tune out the noise. That simply said, investors should watch their portfolio less, right? And stock markets rise and fall every day with many ups and downs throughout the day. And this may cause an anxiety for those who keep their eyes fixed on the daily market movements. The more they watch their portfolio, the more they lose. And here we have an example. Suppose you're investing over a five-year investment horizon. Your perception of your portfolio would change depending on the monitoring period. If monitoring on a monthly basis, you would observe a loss of 39% of the time. Uh, however, if you would uh, monitor it over a five-year period, uh, it's only been negative 17% of the time. Right? So during your regularly scheduled review of your portfolio with your financial advisors, focus on your investment goals. Right? So I think that's one of the main drawbacks of uh, today's environment is that we have too much access to information. Uh, we watch our investment portfolios on a very frequent basis. And the purpose of investing is to stay invested for the long term. So you better don't look at your portfolio every day. Right. The first and most important concept of investing is to stay calm and keep a long-term perspective. So as you've just seen, some investors, when faced with volatility, act on fear and pull their money out of the market, diverting them from their long-term goals. Suppose you put uh, to work a $100 investment uh, into the MCI All Country World Index 20 years ago, then you see that the market has gone through several crises of detectable at the end of the 1990s. We had the global financial crisis in 2008 and the European sovereign crisis in 2011. Now, despite those crises, over the 20-year period, you would still have earned a cumulative return of 167%, which comes down to an annualized return of around 5.1%. Right? So keep a long-term perspective. And we have expressed that in another way in the next chart. So here we look at European equities. And you see that every year there, were, there was some drawdowns in the European equity market. Despite those drawdowns, we see that out of those 21 years, the European equities ended positively 15 out of that, those 21 years. Right? So again, that uh, shows and proves the power of perseverance and the benefits of staying invested for the long term. We've expressed that in another way. So if we now look at, again, the European equities uh, since the end of the 1960s, and basically over a 50-year period, we look at all one-year investment periods. So we roll those one-year investment periods on a monthly basis through time. Now, if we do that systematically, we end up with 590 different one-year periods. Clearly, there was a best and a worst one-year period, right? The best was during the tech bubble, 71% in European equities. The worst one was during the global financial crisis. You would have lost minus 43%. However, if we look at longer holding periods, let's say four-year periods, then you see that uh, we again had a best and a worst period 
right? We had fewer observations, 554 in this case. Uh, we had a best four-year period between April 82 and April 86, uh, around 37.5%. And, uh, and we had a, a worst four-year period uh, between March 1999 and March 2003. And something you see happening already is that the dispersion, huh? or in other words, the difference between the best and the worst return for four-year periods in European equities is much smaller than that dispersion for one-year periods, which was around 115%. Now, if you would hold on to your equities for 13 years or longer, we see something surprising happening. Again, we had um, uh, fewer uh, rolling periods, fewer observations. We had a best and a worst 13-year period. But here we see that the worst 13-year period would still generate a small but positive return in European equities. In other words, Independent of when we started investing between 1969 and 2019, if we would have held on to our equities for 13 years or longer, independent of when we started investing, we would have always made a positive return. And again, this is no guarantee for the future, but it does show you that over a long-term horizon of around 50 years, that if you would have held on to your equities for 13 years or longer, you would have always made a positive return. And you see that that return dispersion is even decreasing more uh, if our holding period becomes longer. So here we look at 20-year periods. So again, the longer the holding period, the smaller the return dispersion between the best and the worst return. And this is only look at index returns, right? You could have enhanced your return by hiring an active manager, for example, or diversifying over several asset classes. Right, so hopefully we've made the case for the importance of long-term investing. Let's move on to another uh, good investment tip uh, around diversification. And I think we've all heard of diversification. Diversification may be reduce overall volatility and provide a smoother ride through bumpy markets. In other words, don't put all your eggs in the same basket. And that's what we see quite nicely in this chart, where uh, perhaps nothing better illustrates the need for a solid diversification than the chart here, which shows how various asset classes performed on a year-by-year -year basis over the last 15 years. The best performing asset class for each year, calendar year is on top of each column. And no asset class has consistently offered the best return year in, year out. And look, for example, at um, Asian uh, large cap equities. Uh, what we see is that in 2007, they were the best performing asset class, and in 2008, they were the worst performing asset class. Right? Uh, nobody knows how this ranking will look like at the end of 2020. And therefore, you better diversify your bets over several asset classes. And the argument for diversification we also made by means of another study. So here, basically, we looked at three different strategies between 1993 and 2019. Um, the first strategy was called chasing the winners. This means that we, are, that we invested all our uh, money in um, the asset class that the previous year was the best performing asset class. Uh, the second strategy was called investing in the losers. This means that we repatriated all our money in the asset class that the previous year was the worst, eh? thinking that this asset class would bounce back. So this kind of a contrarian strategy. And the third strategy was the diversification strategy, which means that we equally spread our capital over the various asset classes available in this exercise. And you can already clearly see uh, which strategy was the best strategy. Yeah, with an annualized return of around 8.1%, the diversification strategy clearly beat the other two strategies with the least volatility as well. Right, and the final investment tip we would like to give you is to stick to your goals. Yeah, when markets are volatile and emotions may run high, it's important to stick to your long-term goals, right? Uh, Goal-based investing involves constructing a 
portfolio goal by goal, assessing risk and return requirements in the context of a specific goal. And you're much more likely to stay invested for the long term if you see your investment in line with your goal. You're much better able to weather the current storms if you see your investments in line with your goal. And now might be the great opportunity to, for example, rebalance your portfolio. And here, for example, we started with a 50-50 uh, portfolio, 50% uh, equities and 50% uh, fixed income. During a bull market, the equity share obviously will change your allocation, right? Um, in which you might adjust that ending allocation in align with your strategic allocation. During a bear market, something you're experiencing right now, um, your fixed income uh, allocation might be the dominant part of your portfolio. So again, now is the time to make an appointment with your financial advisors and perhaps rebalance your portfolio, as now is the time that equities are might be cheap. And finally, um, we, another good investment tip is to uh, drip in the market systematically. In other words, uh, to systematically invest is also known as uh, dollar cost averaging, right? Systematic investing makes it easier for investors to cope with volatility. Most investors are quick to agree that uh, mustering the discipline to make the purchases during a volatile market can be difficult. Systematic investing uh, a fixed amount of money for the regular intervals to an investment. And basically, you buy fewer shares when the market is going up, and you buy more shares when the market is going down. So it's a contrarian investment strategy. Uh, and the result is that over time, your average cost per share may be less than the average price per share. Right, so that's another investment to, to uh, systematically invest in the markets, rather on a monthly basis than a lump sum at once. Because if you invest a lump sum at once, you're basically timing the market, and nobody can time the market. Right, and finally, your financial advisor can help you. And for health-related goals, studies show that people who regularly work with a personal trainer, nutritionist, or a doctor are more likely to have success. Why? Because a personal trainer can help you build a long-term strategy to achieve your goals, keep you motivated, and ensure to stay on track with regular training sessions. Similarly, working with your financial advisors can help you build a long-term investment strategy, keep emotions and biases in check, and stay on track with regular portfolio reviews and adjustments. So that brings us to the end um, of my part. Let's quickly review what we covered. So history has shown us that while markets react to shocks in the short term, they tended to reward patient investors over the long term. Our emotions affect decision-making uh, ability in times of market volatility, and we identified three ways to better cope with market volatility. First of all, to focus on the long term. Secondly, to have a solid diversification. And finally, to remember your investment goals. Right, and then uh, in the interest of time, I would like to hand over to Elsa uh, right now, um, who is going to give you an update from, uh, from a macro perspective. So Elsa, over to you. Yes, thank you, and uh, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good evening. Sorry, for me, it's my uh, morning. And uh, we are in really uh, unprecedented time, and I hope everyone is uh, uh, safe and feeling good. Uh, well, I'm here based in California, and I just discovered yesterday to my daughter make a test that she has the virus. So we try to uh, keep our distance with my daughter, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, I, I I think I want to give a, an overview of what we're thinking about uh, the crisis and uh, how we're going to get out uh, from that, how the economy is going to look like um, after we pass that crisis and we start to see some flattening of, of uh, the curve in, the, in terms of uh, contagion. But we think that we haven't seen uh, the peak so far. Um, you know, as infections are spreading globally with several major economies now experiencing partial or even near complete lockdown, 
Uh, we are in lockdown here in California, but we just heard uh, recently that in New Orleans, uh, the number of cases are rising exponentially. So we have more social distancing and clearly uh, economic activity has completely collapsed. And I would say that is going to be some sort of permanent damage that is going to be made uh, to the global economy. When we're thinking about just, uh, you know, the U.S. economy, when you have a storm during the winter and for five days or a week in the U.S. and the East Coast, everything is shut down. People have to work from home. The deep and the heat on the GDP number in the U.S. is pretty significant. Right now, you have almost the entire world that is shutting down for already a month and maybe a little bit extended. So we think that it's going to be a pretty um, uh, damageable for the global economy, and uh, we want to be, be prepared for that. We also have seen a very abrupt end of the historical equity bond market and a record high level in market volatility. So right now there's a lot of discussion that we're hearing between whether we're going to have after that a V-shaped recovery or maybe uh, an extended U recovery, a little bit more uh, longer term. And we're more in the camp that it might be a little bit uh, more damage after all those central banks are bringing a lot of those bridges for us to go on the other side, you know, to go through those uh, uh, period of maybe loss of jobs, um, you know, companies going to a very difficult time. So there's a lot of liquidity being provided, loans um, to be provided to uh, companies where um, supporting individuals to provide some uh, compensation if for the loss of wages just to go through the crisis. But when you're thinking about it, those support are here just to keep people afloat, to keep companies on life support. All that uh, fiscal stimulus and uh, lending activity that is being provided by the central banks are not going to boost demand. It's just keeping people functioning. So it's a very different type of stimulus that we are um, going to have right now. And uh, clearly we're going to have um, a big rise in unemployment rate. People are going to lose their jobs. So usually when unemployment rate goes up, it can go up very quickly. But in the past, it never has come down quickly. Uh, business can go bankrupt, but it's very hard to become unbankrupt after the crisis. So again, we think that the permanent damage that is going to happen after the crisis is First of all, it's already happening, and, and we think it's going to be a very different world uh, after that. Again, we're very unconvinced about the prospect of a, a rapid uh, recovery, the harm into the business and labor market. We've seen already uh, the jump numbers in the U.S., um, which have not been very good. Uh, we've seen already uh, uh, you know, growth and a lot of consumption and demand that have collapsed uh, already. So um, we think that uh, this time around, you know, banks are going to be well positioned to help uh, the economy rather than hurting the situation compared to the GFC. But again, the hit on the corporate earnings, we haven't seen it yet. So we will expect some further down, downside in the market because we haven't seen all the economic data being released. And I think that when we're going to see the numbers of corporate earnings, uh, you know, might, you might see some rise in default and corporate default, and that's why we need to be extremely prudent. Um, we think that uh, you know, uh, we we have to uh, to be very careful. The, the shock in demand uh, and in the uh, productivity is going to be uh, very important. So what is interesting about uh, our strategy is that we were already positioning the portfolio um, for a big financial shock. So we did not anticipate it at all, the virus or even the oil price shock, but um, we, um, we were prepared already last year 
to put the portfolio in a very defensive position. We were extremely concerned about uh, the, uh, the already the very weak manufacturing sector, the rise in geopolitical risk, the political polarization that we've seen, whether it's in Europe or in the US. So the rise in geopolitical risk was something that we started to be um, more concerned. And on top of it, you had also a lot of distortion of asset prices. So prior to the virus uh, and that oil price shock, we were already concerned about the um, uh, asset prices going up, the huge corporate leverage. A uh, lot of investors were going into those uh, leverage loans, uh, private equity, going into those less liquid securities, boosting asset prices. And we started to be a little bit more concerned. And on top of it, you had also on the other side, a lot of uh, uh, government and central bank that didn't have a lot of ammunition to uh, face any huge downturn or big economic shock. We didn't have a lot of backstops that could be provided by central banks of government because interest rate was so low, fiscal deficit, um, you know, for, for example, in the US, we already started with a very high level. So that's why we wanted to be a little bit more defensive in our portfolio. So really, uh, last year, during the course of 2019, we knew that potentially a trigger political risk, a political accident can cause a big repricing of those financial assets. So again, the damage and the trigger has been the virus, and we didn't know it's going to be something so huge. Uh, but again, the portfolio has been quite resilient during the recent period, as we were already preparing for a financial shock, not that deep, but something on those lines. And so when I'm looking into what we have been doing in the portfolio uh, in order to protect from that situation was to start to de-risk uh, the strategy. We used to have a lot of exposure to local government bond in emerging market countries because those countries were offering positive real yield. You have very attractive yield in some of those emerging market countries. So for example, going in long in Mexico, in Indonesia, you can earn yield of 7 8% in those countries or in Brazil as well. But one thing that we were concerned, if you have a financial shock, emerging market currency will be extremely vulnerable. So what we did is to hedge a lot of the emerging market currency in our portfolio, either directly by hedging out, for example, the Indian rupee, the Mexican peso, the Korean won, but also uh, through proxy hedging, such as the short Australian dollar, which I will discuss a little bit more um, carefully. The Australian dollar, and as you can see more recently, has depreciated strongly during that crisis, during that recent period of volatility, uh, um, uh, as Australian dollar is extremely correlated to commodity prices. So you've seen the sharp drop in commodity prices, the Australian dollar performed the same way. And also it is very tied to China. So China slowing down, that will hit uh, Australian dollar uh, sharply. So by increasing a short Australian dollar versus the US dollar, you're able to protect some emerging market currency that you're not hedging directly. And in fact, the depreciation of the Australian dollar was far greater than the depreciation of EM currency. So we were able to mitigate completely the recent sell-off on EM currency. So that's what we started to build up in our portfolio already in 2019. The other thing that we wanted to do if we were expecting a financial shock was to build up some safe haven positions. So you have two solutions to do it. Either you build long duration in certain market, for example, in the developed markets, in US treasuries, or you can do another approach by starting to be on the safe haven position, such as the Japanese yen or the Swiss franc. And we've noticed that historically, in fact, the Japanese yen has tended to perform 
even better than U.S. Treasuries in period of flight to quality. I'll give you an example, during the global financial crisis, the um, Japanese yen was appreciating 35%, that was the best performing currency during that financial crisis, while U.S. Treasuries was up 20%. But again, being long the Swiss franc or the Japanese yen can allow you to protect the downside of your portfolio. So those are things that we have done building up the bucket in our strategy of safe haven position. And then the other thing that we think were very important uh, was to ensure the liquidity of the portfolio. We have experienced that during the global financial crisis, if you were owning corporate bonds, high yield, dollar denominated bonds and emerging market was absolutely not liquid, was very, very hard to sell. And we know that a lot of money recently due to the um, you know, search for high yielding securities, everyone went into the high yielding leverage loan, EM hard currency, those dollar denominated bonds. The problem is that they are perceived as liquid when the market is going up. The problem is that the underlying securities is not very liquid. So we wanted to ensure that we don't have any of those dollar denominated bonds if we were facing a financial shock. So going into local government bonds is far more liquid than dollar bond. And even though more recently, you know, every central bank around the world are providing a lot of liquidity into the system, but they provide mostly liquidity to the treasury market. Uh, of course, the Fed is now moving more like the ECB and now might provide and support for the corporate side. But a lot of the emerging market countries all around the world, the central banks are mostly providing liquidity and buying their local bond. So again, owning local government bond is more liquid than dollar bond. So that's why entering into that crisis, none of those strategies have credit exposure, spread credit exposure. And also, what we wanted to make sure is that we have some cash buffer in the portfolio. So the cash is quite substantial across all our strategy, a little bit over 10%. And the reason behind it is that we want to keep that dry powder. You know, having some cash today is quite interesting because when we see the peak of the crisis, we might be able to deploy the money when those spread will widen, when we see some... Um, earnings, um, corporate earnings starting to be released and knowing that they are making no money. Uh, you might see a lot of redemption, selling off, spread my widen, even more than what we have experienced recently. We might be able to be shift the portfolio more offensively and taking advantage of going back into the corporate sectors or EM hard currency. But having the cash at the disposal allow us to shift the portfolio more defensively when we see the times is coming more, um, more favorable for us. And then I want to, to highlight that on the duration aspect, yes, we in the past we used to have some negative duration to U.S. Treasury. Today, all those positions have been closed up, so now we are neutral U.S. rate. Um, we don't want to take even some duration exposure in the major developed market. We have some duration exposure and EM to earn that yield, that carry, which is attractive, but also many of those emerging market countries, their central bank have room to cut interest rate, but can make money on capital appreciation as rates decline. But in the developed world, we are already at zero interest rate. There's not a lot of opportunity to make money out of declining rates. They're going to keep rates at a very low level, but you don't have a lot of potential upside to make money on taking long duration in the major developed market. And the other risk that we're seeing is that look into all the huge fiscal stimulus and packets that have been announced recently. We're talking across the board about between five to 10% additional fiscal stimulus, the level of indebtedness of those countries are going to rise. So some countries have room, like Germany, Italy, France, and other countries might not have the ability 
to uh, sustain the debt level are going to rise significantly, which means that the long-term rates might back up. So taking long duration might be a risk because not only you don't have a lot of potential upside, but you might see some downside by taking long duration. And we've seen more recently last week, rates back up across the board as every country were announcing new fiscal package uh, across the board and the concern about debt sustainability longer term. So what is interesting is that, yes, we did not uh, anticipate it. What could be the trigger of that financial shock? It happened faster than we have anticipated. But I would say the portfolio was already well prepared for that. And uh, the recent period have, seen, have shown that we have been able to mitigate uh, a, a lot of the volatility uh, so far. I would say that we would not have been too much concerned about the situation if the virus was happening five years ago. The problem is that we're facing that virus where already we were, if you're looking into the stage of the economy prior to the virus, the economy was we were already at the end of the cycle, at the really the tail end of the cycle. The manufacturing sector was very weak due to the trade tension, but even when we signed the phase one with China, manufacturing sector rebounded a little bit, but we still remain very, very weak across Europe. Manufacturing sector, PMI manufacturing sector was below 50, so it was remaining very weak. Uh, what was supporting growth so far in many countries, and particularly in the U.S., was domestic demand, the consumption. So now that consumption and that domestic demand is going to be hit pretty hard. And that's why we think that uh, the, the, the damage um, is going to be more brutal than if the virus was happening five years ago, where right now fiscal stimulus, ammunition from government are, are pretty low, even though the Fed has cut interest rates 150 basis point. Think about the global financial crisis. Every time we had a recession in the U.S., we needed five percentage point of rate cut to support the growth. Now we're already at zero, and the only thing that we can do is those huge uh, injection of liquidity. So. The other thing that we are thinking about is as we're going to go and we have those bridges to help us survive that crisis, what would the world look like after that? And we think it's going to be a little bit different. Think about all the, the political polarization, people being very angry by, you know, um, mainstream um, uh, politics and, and uh, political parties. Uh, the income inequality was something that was um, creating a lot of anger uh, into people. You know, in the U.S., we had you know moving from either very socialist government with Sanders or you know very protectionism with um, uh, uh, Trump. In a lot of different countries, we've seen those uh, you know either moving their very populist or very nationalist protectionism. If we go out of that situation where today, you know, not long ago, unemployment rate was at 3.5%, we have wage growth. Um, now, if we go in the other side after the crisis, unemployment rate at 10%, you know, will it bring everyone together or, you know, political polarization will continue to, um, um, to, to remain? So that's why we want to see uh, you know, what would be the work looking out ahead after we go through the crisis. So I, I don't want to spend too much time <clears throat> talking about some of those uh, bad situations. It's true that we're a little bit more, um, you know, uh, concerned and worry uh, about uh, the next uh, phase. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to uh, highlight is, that, you know, some of the charts here to show how the Japanese yen has worked very well. Here you see a chart where the dark blue line is showing the performance of the U.S. Treasuries every time you have a peak in volatility. So the shaded area is showing when the VIX index, that's the fear index, what we call the fear index, is going above 20. 
that every time you have a crisis or recession. And you can see that usually the dark blue line, which is the performance of the Japanese yen, versus the light blue line, which is the performance of U.S. Treasuries, have done extremely well most of the time. So that's why uh, we can be defensive using a different approach. Uh, again, that is showing during the global financial crisis. Uh, the Japanese yen did even better than the U.S. Treasuries. In fact, today we are very much positioned the same way that we were entering into the global financial crisis. Uh, long duration on EM, hedging emerging market currencies, long Japanese yen, long Swiss franc, and having a short euro in the portfolio. Uh, in the EM, again, we are looking at very attractive yields. There's, again, a lot of more uh, space in some of those countries, but we know that we need to avoid the default country. Um, a lot of those uh, places that we are investing, we don't want to be too long duration. If you go into a country where you own 10-year maturity bond, you might be negatively impacted even though the central bank is cutting interest rate. We've seen during the global financial crisis that some countries that were cutting interest rate, the long end of the curve was moving higher. So if you're too long duration, you might lose money. So we are trying to be more uh, around a two-year, three-year maturity bond in some of those emerging market countries so we can benefit from the carry and also rates declining. We need to be also extremely uh, differentiating around uh, EM country. We're not going into places like Turkey. We think that would be a country very vulnerable. But we like places like Indonesia. That is a country that might, after the crisis, they're uh, pretty good compared to others. We might see default in emerging market, but others will survive pretty well. When you have a country like Indonesia that is starting with a debt to GDP of 30%, the fiscal deficit, they have a fiscal rule which prevent them to go having a fiscal deficit of more than 3%. Today they have 2.5% of fiscal deficit, not too much debt. Uh, and that country is right now announcing some fiscal measures and allowing the country to have a fiscal deficit going up to 5%. But 5% fiscal deficit when your debt is already starting at 30%, I think that's a country that still will fare much better. So among EM, we're extremely uh, careful. And also one important thing is clearly to, uh, to hedge uh, the, the currency volatility. So again, the portfolio is fully hedged out on the currency side. So when I'm looking into, uh, again, that is an example of the uh, short Australian dollar, you know, it's a good way of hedging when you have a big collapse in commodity prices, the Japanese yen, if you short the Japanese yen, you tend to do very strong performance offsetting the uh, sell-off in commodity producing currencies. And more recently, I'm going to show you a chart where we're looking into the performance of the Australian dollar. And even if I was updating that chart as of, you know, uh, two days ago, the short Australian dollar would have provided a performance of 22% while emerging market currency are down, you know, something like 12, 13%. So again, it's a very good way of protecting, if I'm not doing a direct hedge, on some of the EM currency, I'm more than protecting my emerging market uh, currency piece in, in the portfolio. So I would say I'm fully protected from that. So what I see as a main role for, for the strategy, and you can see those are the performance of major fixed income indices and equity. We can see that right now performance of equity, we're now down, you know, minus 34, 40%. Um, many of the high yielding um, fixed income sector, looking at high yields, European high yields, emerging market debt, they're offering a lot of yield and a lot of people went into those high yielding sectors. The problem is that now they're delivering, you know, minus 25% negative return. Our strategy is still offering attractive yields, similar yields, but we have been able to very much better protect and be much more resilient. In, in the strategy. So again, the strategy offers a great source of diversification. 
a yield that is different from all the other fixed income managers that are getting their yields to less liquid securities, to credit. Um, we are um, defensive, not taking long duration in the major developed market where we see negative yield or very little potential upside, but through some of the safe haven currency, which so far have not kicked in. I would say the Japanese yen has not performed the way we have wanted so far. It has been more or less flat or slightly negative, but we know this um, Japanese investors are very risk averse and a lot of capital is likely to come back into the country supporting the currency. So they have a lot of investment position invested abroad. Now, as liquidity is being provided in the market through the central bank, those Japanese investors will bring back the money the way they always did and uh, strengthening the uh, Japanese uh, yen. So we see a lot of dry powder, a lot of upside potential coming into our portfolio. Um, through that uh, Japanese yen. So I, I stopped here to see if there's any uh, questions. Uh, I know uh, Bill is going to discuss some of uh, you know uh, the different strategies that we have in our um, uh, within the Templeton Global Macro Group. But thanks a lot, and I uh, would be open for any questions. Or Bill, I'll leave you. Um, yep. Hand it over to you. Thank you, Elsa. Yeah. Thanks so much for that update. Um, I'll just briefly go into the three different funds, global bond, total return, and emerging market debt, and then we can open it up to any questions which you might have for Elsa or for Leo. Um, so just to go back over what the, what the Templeton Global Bond Fund is, it is a purely government debt fund, um, so it will only invest in government debt. The global, um, it is currently yielding around 4%, and the average credit quality is around a single A. Um, I, I, I actually had the latest numbers here. So up until yesterday, since the beginning of the year, the fund is down around about 5.7%. So it's held up quite well within this volatility. The global total return is a similar strategy, but it can invest into any of the underlying credit markets. So it can be in government debt, high yield, investment credit, corporate credit. This fund has a slightly higher yield of around 5%, same average credit quality of around the single A. And year to date, this fund is down around about 7.7% .7 since the start of the year, up, up until yesterday. And the final fund, which is on your approved list, is the Emerging Market Bond Fund. Uh, this obviously only invests in emerging market debt. Um, the current yield is around about 8%. I think that's come down a little bit over the last um, over the last two or three weeks. Average credit quality is around a treble B. And year to date, this fund is down around about 10%. And just to put that into context, many high yield funds have been down around 15 to 20%. Equity markets are down 25%, and emerging market debt funds have been down around 20%. So as you heard from Elsa, we believe that we have a unique fund in global bond, total return, and emerging market debt, where with our underlying currency exposures, our low duration, we do have a negative correlation to both equity and to fixed income. We do give you true diversification in these asset classes. So, um, before I hand back to Ingrid, I just want to ask anyone on the floor, do you have any questions for both Elsa or for Leo before we end this session? So I don't think we have any questions coming through. Um, so if I hand back to Ingrid, who can finally close the session for us. So okay. Bill, Thanks, Leo, everyone. and then so we would really like to thank you for your time today and for the information you provided. I am sure we all found it very useful. A big thank you also goes to all of you who joined us today. 
Our team of advisors are available if you have any further questions. Also, please note that further information on the funds discussed can be found on our website, www.medirect.com.mt. Thank you, everyone, once again, and stay safe.